Welcome back there, students. It's time to learn about more science. How exciting. It's biology. Maybe it's at home. Maybe it's in the classroom. Either way, it's on YouTube. It's flip class. Yay. Yay. And today we will be talking about the mechanisms of evolution, arguably the most important topic in all of biology. Don't believe me? Just ask that guy. We're going to talk about the mechanisms of change. There's five of them, and they're pretty easy to remember because uh, we're going to use a nice analogy that goes along with your hand. And uh, actually, I recommend, while you're taking notes on this video, slap your hand down poof, right on the paper. Give the old tracer doodle do. So it sort of looks like this right here because we're going to label all the fingers as the mechanisms of evolution, there'll be a few questions for you to answer. You know, the usual deal. Remember, our definition for evolution is a change in the gene frequencies, or how frequently we see a gene, within a population over generations. Or, how we more commonly say it, change to a group over generations. Not just time, but over generations. All these mechanisms will have a reproductive factor within them. The big thumb, the big one, is the main mechanism that we've already discussed, natural selection. It's on the thumb because like the thumb being your, your strongest digit on the hand, right, the big, the main, the, what separates us from uh, the non-primates, natural selection is the main uh, mechanism that's really driving, this really big thumb pushing the buttons for evolution. Natural selection, think of it like a thumb. Right? We can increase genes that are favorable, or we can decrease genes that are unfavorable. Remember, with natural selection, uh, not everyone is the same in the population, and those with more adaptations, that is, traits that help them survive better, uh, will survive longer, and because they survive longer, they are more likely to make more offspring. So over many generations, you'll see more individuals being born, or just in the population, if we're talking asexual reproduction, with those adaptations, because, you know, that helped their, their ancestors survive and make more of them. That is the natural selection. As a result, though, because we're, we're sort of cutting out all the uh, less fit traits, variation is going to be reduced by big thumb natural selection. That's important. Here are some criteria for natural selection to, ha to occur. First, there must be uh, overproduction. We need to have more organisms in the environment that can actually survive. Uh, we need to have differences that can also be inherited. Can't just be differences, they must be genetically different from each other, so we have to have heritable differences. Uh, there needs to be some kind of what we call a selective pressure, something causing this struggle to survive. Because there's a struggle, there's not enough access to the resources, and or maybe there's predators putting pressure on this population. Because not everyone's the same, there's too many of them, and there's some pressure, then those who are more successful at reproducing will be more likely to have offspring, you know, because that's what happens when you reproduce. And then they're more likely to pass on their genes to the offspring. So over generations, we'll see a big change in our population. So then our next mechanism, which goes on the index finger, this one is called gene flow. Gene flow. I remember this one because gene flow, uh, you go. If I were to point at someone like you, and then I, I point that way, everyone knows that's the universal symbol for like you. Get on out over there. Gene flow. Organisms go, this is our fancy uh, technical term for migration, because you, you shouldn't think of a, a organism just like an individual, like walking around, having features, being adorable, maybe it's a pet, maybe it's whatever. Think of it as a walking, just bag of genetic material. And so when individuals are migrating from one population to another population, now we have uh, what is called gene flow, because we're, they're taking their genes with them. They're taking their reproductive material with them, and when they reproduce in their new location, they will be passing down those genes there. So gene flow, aka migration, there's two main types. There's immigration with a M, you know, because we're coming in. So this is from the perspective of the population, individuals who join your population, join the population, bringing their genes with them that it, they are immigrating into the population. The opposite of immigration would be amigration. Immigration where they come in, amigration where they're going out there, 
exiting, see the, the E for exit. This is when individuals leave their old population, they're taking their genes with them. So in the case down here of the bugs, you'll notice that, they, that it's two sides of the same coin. For the brown bug population, this brown bug is emigrating from the brown bug population. It is immigrating into the green bug population, and it's taking its brown bug genes with it, plus whatever other genes it has that is uniquely adapted from this population that uh, would not be a part of this population. So remember, we call it gene flow, but it's emigrating, right, where you leave immigrating is the other side where you're coming into. See the, the arrows to help remind you? Good work, Grammarly. So that was gene flow. Remember, index finger, because that's how you tell someone, like, you go that away. That's gene flow. Next one, mutation. Be uh, mutation on the, the bad finger. So be careful when you're, when you're discussing this and teaching your friends about the mechanisms of evolution. Make sure you don't show them. The no, see, look, it's the ring finger. It's fine. Like, don't show them the bad finger. Don't show them the bad finger. That's mutation. Why is it on the bad finger? Well, because most of the time when the DNA changes, when it's a muta that's what a mutation is. It's usually a bad thing. Uh, it's sort of like uh, like Mother Nature, like giving you the finger a little bit. So that's why uh, the big finger gets mutation. It's usually bad. Uh, however, like you guys saw in the gizmo uh, with, the, with the beetles, this is one of the only few ways that we can create what's called a novel trait, or we can make a new trait that didn't otherwise exist in the population. Sure, if it exists somewhere else, it could immigrate and bring those genes in, or we just have a random spontaneous change to the genes that could produce a new trait as well. And over, you know, thousands and thousands of generations, the machinery that copies and replicates our DNA, it's a little sloppy. There's some built-in mistakes. We'll talk much more about this and all the topics, really, when we get into our genetics unit. But for now, you need to know that mutation is one of the ways that we could have a new trait, but, but it only matters if it's beneficial or not. If it's a new trait that doesn't affect how fit the organism is, how likely it is to survive and reproduce and also have offspring who can survive and reproduce, then uh, it won't really matter. But if it changes the fitness level, maybe it makes it worse, that gene will be eliminated. Maybe it could make it better, so that gene would be sort of turned up, be enhanced. So mutation is only just the way of getting the new gene, the new trait in the environment. Then we'll still have big thumb natural selection, you know, deciding, I guess, if it's useful or not, and making more individuals or less individuals show that trait over generations. Same thing really with immigration and emigration. New individual moves in, if they're bringing novel traits to that environment that are useful, natural selection could turn them up or could turn it down. Ooh, I just thought of that. Could increase the gene frequency, could decrease the gene frequency for detrimental traits. How fun. Oh, we'll have to use that one later. Natural selection. On the ring finger, because, you know, that's how we show that we are belonging to spouses. On the ring finger, that is sexual selection, sexual selection. This is a specific type of natural selection because technically like nature is still making this selection, but it's all about reproduction. So if we're looking at an asexual population, there is no sexual selection. This is only for sexual reproduction. Changing the gene frequency due to mate selection. Uh, could be based on heritable traits or uh, just traits that we, uh, or the individuals, find it desirable, uh, usually size, strength, coloration, things like that. When you see sexual selection in nature, it's usually the males are competing for the females. Usually the males have some big, bright, exorbitant trait that helps attract the females as their mates. And usually the females are, are smaller, uh, more plain. Uh, females are gonna choose their mate based on characteristics like uh, maybe it's uh, big, maybe it seems strong, maybe it's really fast, maybe it seems like a more healthy individual, maybe it's more persistent. Right? I mean, it makes sense that that would be rewarded in nature, right? That grit, that determination that I'm never going to give up and I will outrun this predator if I have to. You can, you can see why these would be desirable traits for a female to want to pass to her offspring. Uh, impressive courtship display, one of, my, one of my favorites 
is is like, like the, uh, with these desert snakes, and they'll they'll lay there, and the male snake will like come over to like female and be like, "Hey, baby, what's up?" And she'll be like, "Now you have to wait." And so he'll just sit there and wait. And the female snake's in there, and then another snake comes over, and he's like, "Hey, baby, what's up?" And she's like, "Okay, you and you, you two fight over each, fight it out, wrestle it out. I'll mate with the winner." And so they'll get up and like do this big like snake wrestling contest, <clears throat> and whichever snake pins the other snake, that one. Clearly, the stronger, a better snake in the eyes of the female. So they will get to mate together, not loser Mick can't wrestle snake. So that would be an impressive courtship display. You'll see it with like chipmunks chasing each other or squirrels chasing each other. That's, that's they're not territorial usually. That's, that's a male trying to show a female that, hey, I'm, I'm fast, I'm quick, we can reproduce. I got good genes, baby, I got good genes, right? Maybe impressive coloration. We see this with like, like uh, peacocks, right? The males have that big bright plumage. That's all about attracting females. Or cardinals, right? Cardinals, bright red, stand out, big crest. That's for attracting females. What's interesting is sexual selection sometimes will work against natural selection and could lead to non-adaptive traits. That would be uh, our fancy scientific terminology for traits that hurt your fitness. Chances of survival go down, right? Like uh, think cardinals. Cardinals, where do they live? They're native to Ohio. That's our state bird. What color is Ohio? Spoiler alert, except for in the fall, it's not red at all. Cardinals hanging out there being big, red, stands out among all those green trees where they're trying to hide and live. The females, nice brown color, blend in with the trees where they're making their nests in the branches. So it actually makes the males less likely to survive because of natural selection, but it makes them more likely to survive well, more likely to reproduce because of sexual selection. So you get a lot of what we call sexual dimorphism. Di meaning two, morph meaning form or shape. So you get a lot of uh, the males and females looking very different and could lead to non-adaptive traits being in the environment, traits that actually hurt survival, becoming more popular because uh, it's more desirable for the females. And so we have increased reproductive success at the expense of survival rate like the peacock tail. Look at that big honking thing. Yeah, yeah, it looks like eyes and could maybe intimidate some predators, but uh, no, it's, it's huge, it stands out, it makes them slow and mobile. Females are like, yeah, look at that tail, please. But a predator is like, look at that thing. I'll bet I can chase it down and murder it and eat it. No problem, look at me go, I'm a big scary predator. That was sexual selection, which now leads us to the smallest finger on the hand. Notice it's my left hand, so we got finger involved. But yeah, the left tiniest because it really only affects tiny populations. See the smallest, wimpiest finger? Because it's the most affecting small populations. It's called genetic drift, which is just a really weird, uh, complicated term to say, random oopsies done messed up the gene pool. And again, you want to note that it's the small finger because it's more likely to affect the small populations than it is to affect the larger populations. Here's an example of genetic drift. Uh, I know this picture sort of makes it look like the guy's stomping on him, but really just walking around. So we're walking around, and here's some, some uh, beetles. You'll notice we've got a variation of size, variation of color. And these beetles here just happen to be wrong place, wrong time. The guy's walking, bloop, 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 bloop. Doesn't even see the beetles. It just happened to take out two-thirds of the big green ones. That's a significant change to the genetic diversity, the genetic makeup of this population. But it just was random chance. Wrong place at the wrong time. Natural disasters, that's a great example for genetic drift. Was there a big weird flood that just happened to take everything out and that flood doesn't happen very often? Did this tree happen to just get struck by lightning? Doesn't necessarily mean that tree is less fit for the environment. Does that mean that the organisms that decided to make their nests and home inside the tree are less fit for the environment? No, it was a freak accident. It was weird. That's genetic drift. Those genes drifted away because of random chances or dumb luck, and again, only causes big changes in a small population, and that's why we put it on the little finger. So right here, these are your five mechanisms, your five causal agents of evolution, your five mechanisms of change, what causes the gene frequencies 
in a population to change over generations. There are five different mechanisms, and as you saw, many of them actually get affected by natural selection. So remember, the big thumb, turning genes up or turning genes down over generations, still the main causal agent of evolution, which is why we spend so much time on it. In addition to that, there's a couple other like special selections. Instead of uh, natural selection, humans in our ever, uh, ever, ever surprising levels of hubris have decided that although we are a species that evolved on this planet, when we are selecting who gets to live and die, then it's not <laughs> natural selection. We call it artificial selection because we're somehow outside of nature or something. But uh, human modification, uh, by selecting and who's going to breed and who's going to pass on the traits. We also call this selective breeding. Remember, this was one of the pieces of evidence that Darwin used in his book on the origin of species explaining natural selection. He, he, he grew up on a farm, so he was already familiar with, you want a fast horse? Take two fast horses, have breed them together, take the fastest of their offspring, breed them together, make faster and faster horses. We've also done it with a myriad of organisms on this planet. One of my favorite examples is how all dogs share the common ancestor, Canis lupus, the gray wolf, and all dogs, we bred them selectively to have these myriad of traits all of them being Canis familiaris, the dog. All of these are the same species, even though that we've bred them very selectively to, to sort of enhance the traits that we found desirable. We've done it with food for thousands of years. We invented corn. Corn is in the grass family. Like, you know, the stuff you mow, not very edible. Pretty gross, actually. We invented corn. Believe it or not, we invented like cauliflower and broccoli out of these weird brassicky, gross nastiness, like native cabbage things. And we turned them into plants that we could gain nutrition from. You see where we're going with the whole like making plants uh, be different because we need them to suit certain needs. That's exactly what we're doing with GMOs. We're going to talk way more about the process of uh, genetically modifying organisms once we get into uh, DNA, because it's a really cool application of how genes work. But for now, you can sort of think of it as a much, 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 much faster version of the artificial selection. Instead of having to actually selectively breed the corn to get tastier corn, we can just use a bacteria vector and a plasmid, that's a little ring of DNA, put in whatever genes we want into the corn, grow the corn seeds, and boom, there we go. We can do what used to take thousands of generations. We can do it in a couple hours in a lab. So this is really push what we can do to select the traits we want and really made it faster. Plus, with GMOs, we can take any trait from any species. It doesn't have to be something that's already there. Like when we made dogs, those were based on traits that were already present in the wolf. Believe it or not, chihuahuas have traits that are like the wolf. With GMO, we can take traits from anything and we just put them in there. And with some of our gene editing technology now, we can actually invent new traits that don't even exist by simulating mutations, put them in. It's a really, really crazy and cool topic, and we will spend more time on it later. But for now, that's all I have on the mechanisms of change. Thanks for watching. I'm gonna turn the camera off. Hopefully it recorded that. Otherwise, I will be grumpy when I have to do it all again. <laughs>